there uh, make a couple of announcements real quick. Yes, tonight we are the elders and the board of directors are meeting with our youth pastor candidates, Mike and Michael and Aureli Pilcher, and uh, so we're we're progressing on, and, and we're going to be talking with them as a leadership team of the church and uh, uh, kicking the tire, so to speak, and uh, keep praying with us. We want the right people in this position, and we want the best for them as well. And uh, I believe if we're all praying to that end, Lord, let your will be done, it will be done. And uh, so we would very much appreciate your prayers on that. Uh, announcements for stuff that is coming up. Uh, this coming Friday is going to be uh, Thursday night. Quilting is canceled. Just remember that. Uh, no quilting part, party going on. Friday night <clears throat> will be game night here. So uh, y'all come out. We're going to have some uh, 42, maybe some Mexican train or or what did what did you call it? Hispanic locomotion. Yes. <clears throat> We're going to be having some of that going on in there, the uh, uh, and bring you bring your finger foods and all that sort of stuff. And uh, I do need to make a disclaimer right now: any money won must be tithed on. Amen. You hear me? Hey, we're firm believers now. Got to give God a share. Uh, and then uh, uh, don't forget the. Uh, our church's 16th anniversary coming up. There, there is on the table out here in the foyer. There is uh, sign-up sheets uh, to bring food for the fiesta we're going to have. And uh, so, um, fiesta does not mean beanie weenies. <laughs> Come on, people! I like them too, but this is fiesta now. I guess you put a little chili powder in there. <laughs> Maybe that'll make it a little more festive. But uh, y'all sign up for that. We're going to have a great time. Great, great time. Looking forward to that. Is that it? Is that all the announcements? Lynn, do we got anything else? Very good. All right. This, <clears throat> the topic for today and next week is going to be dealing with being led by the Holy Spirit. How do you know if we're going to be a church after the heart of God, we have to be led by God. And that's... The Father is on the throne. If you're wondering where they're at, God's on the throne. Hallelujah. No matter what's on Capitol Hill, we know who is on the throne. Jesus is at the right hand making intercession for you and I. That's what the Bible says. So who is it that's down here doing all the work? It's the Holy Spirit. We do not need to be afraid of the Holy Spirit. And uh, uh, all the Pentecostals said, yeah, those that aren't, mm, no. Look, the Holy Spirit is not here to make us be weird. We do that on our own. What the Holy Spirit does is He comes to remind us of who our God is. He's here to lead us and direct us. If we follow those steps, uh, God's going to do a, do a fantastic job. And I just kind of feel like bringing a word today because I had me some apple pie warmed up with some ice cream on it. So <clears throat> we'll get out of here by 8 o'clock, I promise. And uh, the gumbo, by the way, fantastic. And I, I do have a disclaimer on this. My wife is my witness. I'm making my admission to my mother, okay? I had boiled okra for the first time in my life. It was good. It, it was. Looked like snot hanging off the fork, but but I ate it. I ate it, and it was good. It was good. Fantastic. And uh, uh, what? I'm just, I'm just curious. We're going to ignore everybody here and have a conversation. What sausage did you put in that? Okay. Okay. I'm I'm a white boy, and that that put a spice in my mouth. I, I, I think I drank three cups of water chasing that sausage. Now that was fantastic. Thank you. So dealing with dealing with being spirit led, because as Christians we need to live a spirit led life, and when we come together, it means we need to have a spirit led church, because God knows how to do this better than any of us. Matter of fact, he knows how to do this better than any of us. And uh, I, I, I'm a firm believer that the Holy Spirit will do the job if we get out of the way and let him. 
William Booth had started the Salvation Army many, many years ago at the end of the 19th century made this statement. He said, the chief danger of the 20th century, and I think you'll see this bleeds over into the 21st. The chief danger of the 20th century will be religion without the Holy Spirit, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without God, and a heaven without a hell. And I think, I think the man was a prophet at that moment when he wrote that because that's exactly where we are living at today. So, to tell you how the Holy Spirit leads us, let's talk about Bobby the Wonder Dog a minute. In August of 1923, some of y'all remember them days, Frank and Elizabeth Brazier uh, with their daughters Leona and Nova went on a road trip to visit relatives in Indiana. It was about a 2,500 mile trip from Silverton, Oregon. And I got the map there where you can kind of see the track. When they left the Northwest bound for the, the Midwest, they also brought their family pet Bobby, who was a two-year-old Scotch Collie English Shepherd mix. And at some point during their time in Indiana, their dog got in a fight with three neighbor dogs. How many know that's a little outnumbered? And uh, uh, they whooped up on Bobby pretty good, and Bobby ran off like any wise creature would. And after a very exhaustive search, they couldn't find the dog. And the, when it came time to head back to Oregon, they, the dog never came back to the house. And they wound up leaving brokenhearted because they had to go home without their family pet. In February of 1924, six months later, Bobby showed up at the house in Silverton, Oregon. Mangy, dirty, and scrawny, and all of her claws just worn down to nubs that he showed all the signs that he walked the entire distance. Think about this. Swimming all the rivers, crossing the continental divide over the mountains during the coldest part of the winter. How on earth? During this ordeal that, again, 2,500 miles across plains, deserts, winter mountains, all to get home, that would be approximately 14 miles a day over a six-month period just to get home. And after he showed up at Silverton, word got out, and it was in the newspaper, and, and there was like a meteoric rise to fame. I mean, suddenly Bobby was a famous dog uh, getting national attention and featured in newspapers all across America. He was the subject of an article in Ripley's Believe It or Not, those of you that can remember that, uh, books and, and film. Matter of fact, Bobby played himself in a 1924 silent film called The Call of the West and even got letters from people overseas. Why would you write a letter to a dog? I don't know, but they did. They wrote letters to him. Interestingly, during the original trip when the Braziers were heading home, it's like it was way back then. You didn't have motels everywhere. You didn't have money to, to access one. So they would park every night at a service station under the lights and they would spend the night in their vehicle. And uh, reports came in about seeing this dog traveling and apparently that dog followed their exact route going to those places like it was smelling their owner there, knew it was on the right track and just kept on going and never stopped until it got home from its journey. Truth is stranger than fiction. It's crazy the stories that are out there. And and phenomenon like this just really blow my mind, thinking about how this happens. Like with migrating whales and birds to homing pigeons, and 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 this isn't the first story we have heard about a cat or a dog that went cross country to find their owner. I mean, that's not the first or only one. It's happened again and again. And it's almost as if a hand leads them when the whales migrate, when the birds are flying north or south. It's as if a hand is leading them. And maybe it is because this sort of thing happened once before and it's in your Bible. So we're going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 6. <clears throat> 1 Samuel chapter 6, starting in verse number 1. This is after what was called the Battle of Ebenezer. It said the ark of the Lord remained in 
Philistine territory seven months in all. Then the Philistines called in the priests and the diviners and asked them, What should we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us how to return it to its own country. Send the ark of God of Israel back with a gift, they were told. Send a guilt offering so the plagues will stop. Then if you are healed, you will know, uh, then if you are healed, you will know it was uh, his hand that caused the plague. Well, what sort of guilt offering should we send, they asked. And they were told, since the plague has struck both you and your five rulers, make five gold tumors and five gold rats, just like those that have ravaged your land. Make these things to show honor to the God of Israel. Perhaps then he will stop afflicting you and your gods in your land. Don't be stubborn and rebellious as Pharaoh and Egyptians were. How do you know it's good to see it's not just Christians who are stubborn? Hallelujah. By the time God was finished with them, uh, they were eager to let Israel. Uh, they, were, they were eager to let Israel go. Now build a new cart. Find two cows that have just given birth to calves. Make sure that the cows have never been yoked to a cart before. Hitch the cows to the cart, but shut their calves away in a pen. Put the ark of the Lord in the cart, and beside it place a chest containing the gold rats and gold tumors, as you are sending as a guilt offering. Then let the cows go wherever they want. If they cross the border of our land and go to Beth Shemesh, we will know it was the Lord who brought this great disaster upon us. And if they don't, we will know it was not his hand that caused the plague. It simply happened by chance. Verse 10, so these instructions were carried out. Two cows were hitched to a cart, and their newborn calves were shut up in a pen. Then the ark of the Lord and the chest containing the gold rats and gold tumors were placed on the cart. And sure enough, without veering off in other directions, the cows went straight along the road towards Beth Shemesh, lowing as they went. The Philistine rulers followed them as far as the border of Beth Shemesh. The people of Beth Shemesh were harvesting wheat in the valley. When they saw the ark, they were overjoyed. The cart came into the field of a man named Joshua and stopped beside the large rock. So the people broke up the wood of the cart for fire and killed the cows and sacrificed them to the Lord as a burnt offering. Several men from the tribe of Levi lifted the ark of the Lord uh, and the chest containing the gold rats and gold tumors from the cart, placed them on the large rock. Many sacrifices and burnt offerings were offered to the Lord that day by the people of Beth Shemesh. And the five Philistine rulers watched all of this and then returned to Ekron the same day. I'm about to break this story down for you in different increments to show you just how incredible this story is. Matter of fact, there's a prophetic picture hidden in the middle of this story about Jesus Christ himself. Now, if you had read the prior chapter, don't do it right now, but if you had read the prior chapter, you'll find that the Philistines uh, uh, stealing the Ark of, of the Covenant after the Battle of Ebenezer, brought uh, God had brought judgment upon that nation with a plague of rats and apparently a, pra- uh, a plague of tumors as well. And as a penance to God, they made golden images of these things to put with it. What's interesting about this, to, to fashion a gold rat. How many of you would like to have that sitting on your mantle? That would be weird. But a gold tumor. Now this is, this is unique because... When you translate the Hebrew of the Old Testament to the Greek, it translates to tumors in the groin. There are some scholars that have made a suggestion that this was probably a large outbreak of hemorrhoids. And they made a gold statue of it. It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. That's weird, but it's there, okay? Now, there there are many interesting features to this whole story which shows the intricate pattern of how the Holy Spirit works without the need for people, okay? Now, God uses His people when people are willing to be used. But can I tell you, God still moves on His own. We serve a great God who knows what He's doing and He knows how to make things happen even if nobody else is being busy in the middle of it. So first of all, I want you to see this. The Holy Spirit made the Philistines as glad to part with the ark as they were to take it. Oh, we got it. Matter of fact, they took it as a ransom 
to make Israel pay through the nose to get it back because they knew they had something good here. But God got involved in the mix. Not They were glad to get it, but seven months later, they were glad to get rid of it. Go away. Kind of like grandkids. What? Rats and nether afflictions outweighed the trophy of conquest. We're miserable. we got to get rid of this thing. Not to mention how the Holy Spirit had destroyed the Philistine god Dagon, his statue, because they had actually put it in the in Dagon's temple. And they came in one day. Here's Dagon. There's, there's the Ark of the Covenant. They came in one day and they found it flat on its face, knocked down towards the Ark, like it's giving it respect. They put it back up, came in the next day, its head was cut off and its hands were cut off in the same... It, there's, there's pictures there that to you and I, we don't get. But to the Philistines, that was, that was utter disrespect, but it showed there's somebody bigger here than Dagon. It was, it was a lot of humiliation. So even without receiving a ransom for Israel as they hoped to do, the enemy of Israel not only returned the ark for free, but they added some treasure to boot as an apology to get rid of it. And my question in reading this was, where's the rescue team? Where's, where's the Israeli seals? Where's, where, you know, this is special to us in our religion. Where, where were the, the recon spies to go out and find this thing? They weren't there. Israel did not go after it. So God had to deliver it for Himself. Matthew Henry, the, the old, old commentator, biblical commentator said this, God will be no loser in His glory at last by the successes of the church's enemy against His ark. But He will get Himself honor from those who seek to dishonor Him. What a powerful statement. You're not going to dishonor God. As a matter of fact, God will make sure you give Him honor. And what, a picture there, the very last sentence of that scripture says that these Philistine leaders, these five kings, followed it all the way to the Israeli town to see what was going to happen. That's a very unkingly thing. As a matter of fact, that's a humiliating thing. Because a king would say, hey, you servants, go out there and follow them and report back to me and tell what's done. That's not what happened. They went on their own like servants to go see what was taking place. God had a way of humiliating them and they may not have even known it. Now the second thing is that the Holy Spirit in the midst of all this brought revival to their people. The, the men of Beth Shemesh were busy during the wheat harvest. They were busy working the land. They, they were doing secular business, not thinking about the ark. They weren't making inquiries about it. Don't know that their mind was even on God. They're busy doing the day's labor. As a matter of fact, it kind of reads a little bit like Haggai chapter 1, verse 9, where the prophet said, My house lies in ruins, says the Lord of heaven's armies, while all of you are busy building your own fine houses. You're taking care of yourself, but you're not taking care of the Lord's things. So in his own time, God will bring deliverance to His church, not only as it's being fought against by her enemies, but even as it's being neglected by its friends. So when we start looking at what politics start doing against the church of Jesus Christ in America, and it's coming, guess what? We've got a God that's going to rise up and defend us, even when those that call themselves Christians aren't lifting a finger. We are God's children, and He's going to take care of us. Now some scholars observe that at the least that this tiding of good news comes while the men of the city are busy. They're faithful in their employed duties instead of being lazy and unproductive. They weren't just laying around on welfare. They're out there actually working. Similarly, when Jesus was born, the news was brought to their shepherds. What does the Bible say? As they were keeping their flocks by night. Matthew Henry, the commentator, again says this. The devil visits idle men with temptations, but God visits industrious men with His favors. So when the working men looked up and they saw the ark, can you imagine the surprise? Suddenly there's the thing, the thing they have grieved about, the thing that they have longed for, the thing that they wished they could have back. There it is right there in front of them. And they finally discerned what it was that they were looking at. And man, all the joy that could rush up in there. 
This actually is captured in Psalms 126 in verses 1 and 2. It says, it describes this moment like this. It was like a dream. We were filled with laughter and we sang with joy. It was like a dream. We were filled with laughter and sang for joy. Why? Because God is back in Israel. To them, that was, that was the presence of God. And so to them, God is back in our midst. And even though they didn't have the courage or the zeal to go after the ark, nevertheless, they had plenty of excitement to give it a proper welcome uh, with worship and even a sacrifice. Now, the third one is where we get in with the cows. And I want you to see this. The Holy Spirit caused the cows that never left Ekron to know how to, the way to bring it home. Ancient Ekron is believed to be located 20 miles west of Jerusalem, halfway between it and the sea. There's nothing there today but a hill in the middle of the field. Ekron was about a 10 to 12 mile journey from Beth Shemesh. Imagine, there's, you, got, you got Ekron over here in Philistine territory. There's a line and just across the line is the first city you come to uh, in Israel and that's Beth Shemesh. Now, Think about all the hurdles that the Philistines made for this sign to be clear uh, to prove that God was actually in the scene of all of it. You had these cows that had never been yoked before. I don't know if any of you have ever had to yoke cows before. It's kind of like getting on a horse that's never been broke before. They just take to it like that, don't they? No. No. They had never left their calves before. These are brand new calves. And a mama cow, they guard them calves. And they had never been away from their own fields. They would never been out of this territory. And yet, those cows drew the wagon orderly, the Bible says, always forward. There was no driver away from their barn and their babies, never turning away to eat or to rest or get a drink. They came straight to the city of Beth Shemesh, which, now get this, Beth Shemesh was a priestly city that dated back to the days of Moses' brother Aaron. Smack dab in the middle of Judah, the land of the temple priests, to a field full of priests who knew what to do. Now get this. Not only did that thing just roll up into this town, it picked a town full of priests. This ark would not matter to anybody else near as much as them. And not only did it show up to them, they knew exactly what to do with that box. They knew exactly what to do in that moment. Because God made sure it got to the people who knew what it was and how to appreciate it. That's God, man. That's incredible. When you, It could have rolled up in some other town. Florence, Israel. You know? <laughs> well, what's that? It's a gold box. Bring it here. I got stuff to put in it. You know, we don't know what to do with the Ark of the Covenant. They did. Beautiful. The Holy Spirit led dumb animals against all odds to the right place and to the right people. And of all things, the Bible says, they brought it to the field of Joshua with the large rock in the middle, which comes from the Hebrew word Yeshua, which is the same name as what? Jesus. It says they brought it to the field of Jesus that was full of Jesus' priests in the middle of a field next to a large rock. Can I tell you what that rock was in the middle of that field? Psalms 18.2 says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock. 1 Samuel 2, 2, there is no rock like our God. Genesis 49, 24, the mighty one of Jacob by the shepherd, the rock of Israel. Deuteronomy 32 says, he is the rock and his deeds are perfect. Psalms 18, for who is God except the Lord? Who but our God is a solid rock? The Lord lives, praise to my rock. May the God of my salvation be exalted. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, all of them drank from the same spiritual water. They drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them, and that rock was Christ. Paul's words. He goes on and says in Psalms 118, the stone that the builders rejected now became the what? The cornerstone. Isaiah 28, therefore this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I am placing a foundation stone in Jerusalem, a firm and tested stone. It is a precious cornerstone that is safe to build on. Whoever believes will never be shaken. 
Can I tell you that the rock and stone in that field was the Lord Jesus Christ in His own field. That's the picture that the Bible is trying to portray right there in that story. It is a picture of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Because here He is riding on the colt of a donkey. Guess what? That had never been ridden away from its mother. And he got on that thing and he came walking in. And who's there to greet him? Not the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but the ones who knew how to praise him. Saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Mmm. 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 That's almost as good as pie and ice cream. Woo! Now come on. Only God could have orchestrated every piece of that story for it to work out the way it did. And we would read that story and say, huh, pretty cool. <laughs> it's amazing how the wisdom of God is sometimes lost on the ignorance of men. It is. Until you begin to say, Lord, show me your word. What were you trying to say? And the Lord's saying, just as I've led those cows to where they needed to be. Just as I led my son to come at just the right time. So I will lead you. I will lead you. But God, I don't know what to do. He does. Do you know before you ever came to a problem, God already knew that problem was coming. But by the time you got to that problem, He already knew the solution on how to get out of it. Somebody heard me today. That's the God we serve. Have you ever felt you just don't know the path that lies before you? God, what am I supposed to do? Now I know many of you in here are so blessed, righteous. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory be to your own name. But for the rest of us in humanity, we come, against, we come into things and we say, God, I don't know what to do. Do I do this or do I do that? Do I go here or do I go there? Do I give this or not give this? What, what am I supposed to do? Do you question whether God can or will be able to help you? That ought to be something every one of us has struggled with at some point. Has darkness drowned out the light? Because I'll tell you, those priests out in the field gathering the grain were in a very dark place. And then they looked up on the hill and guess what stood there? The answer to their dilemma. The answer to their cries and their prayers. God showed up. And guess what? God showed up on His own. And the people needed it. You see, that's the great thing about God. When you need Him, you're going to find Him. Oh, wait a minute. That's what the Bible says. <laughs> Jeremiah, you will search for me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. You never have to question about whether God will be there because I'll tell you, He's there. The problem is that sometimes our eyes get so accustomed to the darkness we forget that there's light out there. That light of Christ is not like striking a match in the darkness. It's like turning on a, a lighthouse, flooding everything with His glory. We forget. We forget just how good our God is. It would have been easy watching these earthquakes take place. Remembering back in 9-11 with all the devastation that would be down there on ground zero. We weren't there. I don't, I don't know if any of you were there at that time. I wasn't anywhere. I was, at, I was in West Texas. But I can't even imagine the darkness that would have been in that place with all the catastrophe and the carnage and the damage and the unknowing and the uncertainty. But I will tell you, there have been times in my life, in my life, where I wondered if God even knew who I was. Even as a pastor. God, do you know what I'm going through? Do you see what I'm dealing with? Do you understand how broken hearted I am? And listen, the fact that you make those cries is, is not an, an indictment on your soul. Because even Jesus said, my God, my God, hanging on that cross, why have you forsaken me? There comes a point in all of our lives where we face that darkness and have to ask God, 
Where are you? Can I tell you, if you'll allow the Holy Spirit to lead you, He will always lead you down that right path. Proverbs chapter 3 says to trust in the Lord with all your, all your heart and lean not into your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. He will direct your path. Because God's got a thing He's doing. Look, He's got a thing He's doing in your life. He wants to lead your life specifically. But can I tell you, while He's busy trying to manage 8 billion lives at one time, He's also navigating the waters of all the countries. God said from the beginning, I've got a plan at the very end. That's the difference between our religion and every other religion. God foretold the ending from the very beginning. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm up to. And guess what, church? He's doing it. He's doing it. He's going to make sure that everything happens down to the T prophetically when it comes to the, those last days when Jesus Christ, it says He will be in that cloud. And the angels will come and gather them up. He don't know. The angels don't know. But the Father knows when that time is. The Bible says. And guess what? He's busy working all that out. In my mind, I sit there and think about that. About all the things that He is putting together. All the, th all the pieces He's working with. With nations and rulers and, and powers that be. And even the darkness, the demonic darkness that tries to undercut His plan. And yet, God has time to show up and talk to Mike Sullivan. I want to tell you where the most spiritual place in this church is. It's up there in that attic. Pastor Joe told me that. He said, man, I like praying in here. But there's something about being in that upper room. And can I tell you, you can ask Glenn. I'll grab my, my devotional books, my, my prayer journal, and I'm off to the upper room. And I go up there and I spend some time with God. You know what? I was sitting up there today, had my worship music playing, going through my devotionals, and God just started parting the hair. He's just started just wisdom, man. Wisdom being poured out. And I was like, whoo, God, that's good. Do you know he's busy working in Turkey and Syria? He's busy trying to sort out the mess in Washington and Hollywood. He's busy, 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 busy. And yet he had time to show up today in that attic and talk to this pastor. He does it. He does it for you too. See, that's what it is about being led by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to lead and direct your steps. There's moments where you, you ever picked up the Bible and just opened it up and it just happened to be the right word you needed? What a coincidence! <laughs> Woo, no, God knows what He's doing. God knows what He's doing. And if we allow God to lead us, He leads us in the most beautiful ways. He can lead a dog over the mountains. He can lead cows across, uh, across nations. He can lead you to the center of His will. The hard part is keeping your nose out of it. Because we'll look at it, Mike, and we'll say, Lord, that don't make sense. Since when has God ever made sense? You know what I'm talking about? He spoke and the world's existed. They never spoke nothing and something was created. You got to get in there and do it yourself. Don't cause a mess. That's why I have a good wife help me clean it up. But God has a way of making sure you get to where you need to be if you'll just be obedient to be led. Those cows could have turned off. They could have been stubborn and they could have turned off this way or turned off this way. But you know what? God led them. And how many times has God tried to lead us and we said, I ain't going to do it? I'm not going to look at your faces. Let me say this again. How many times has God told us to do something and we wouldn't do it. Let me encourage you with so well, let me correct you with something. It ain't much encouragement, it's correction. When the Lord says in his word, don't lie, and you do, it's a sin. Don't commit murder. If you do, it's a sin. 
if God tells you to do something and you're not obedient, it's a sin. We have got to live our lives in the obedience of Christ. Because I'll tell you, His ways are better than my ways. His ways are better than your ways. And sometimes it don't make sense. Sharing the story with you, how God laid on our heart to give the, the money we had set aside for a house. We gave it away to a missions thing because God said to do it. And it was like the next day, that exact amount of money came back to us from another source. If you be obedient, God can work great things. And do you know what the outcome of that is? You have a testimony. And let me tell you what that testimony is worth. There is a gun. Holds two bullets. It's like a derringer, but it's a big one. And it says that the devil is destroyed by two things. One bullet is the blood of the Lamb. You ain't got nothing to do with that. But that other bullet is what? The word of our testimony. Let me tell you, devil, why I know I'm going to make it. Let me remind you of how you have failed again and again. My God has me. He kept me there. He kept me there. He kept me there. So I know He's going to keep me right there. We don't have to live in fear. We don't have to live in worry because God's got us. This is a day of freedom. I believe this word is a moment of freedom for somebody. The Holy Spirit still leads and accomplishes what mere people cannot do for themselves. He doesn't need you to do it. He needs you to accept it. He needs you sometimes to stay out of the way and just let Him do His work. My wife and I, and and listen, all I know is the stories that we have. But I'm telling you, just as I'm standing behind this pulpit today, six months ago I was unemployed and had no idea what God wanted to do with my life. Look at what God does. He can create something out of absolutely nothing. So what does God want to do in your life? How is it that God is wanting to direct your steps and direct your path? I'm talking to the church today. You came out on a on a, a post-rainy Wednesday night. I'm talking to the church today. You love the Lord. You want to serve Him. The question is, is how well do you let Him lead you? Because as you are led by God, this church will be led by God. What happens if God says, I need the church to go this way, and we buck up and say, mm-mm, we're going this way. Why? Because this is how we've always done it. Now, praise the Lord, you've never said that in your life. <laughs> That's all them other churches out there that say those seven deadly words. We ain't never done it that way before. But what would happen if God's saying, this is how I want to lead a church? I don't know about you, but I want to follow God. That cloud by day and fire by night, I want to follow it. I want to follow Him. I want to follow Him with my personal life. I want to follow Him as a pastor of a church. I want to follow Him with you. That God, whatever it is that you're wanting to do, let's do this. Let's do this. So tonight, dealing with the issue of being led by the Holy Spirit, do you know Him? Do you know Him intimately enough to know His voice? Jesus, John chapter 10, My sheep know My voice. And the voice of Jesus is the voice of the Holy Spirit that you hear. When He wants to lead you, when He wants to direct you, would you be able to discern His voice from every other voice out there? See, if we're going to be Spirit-led, we got to know who He is. We've got to be able to follow Him. And I'll be the first to admit, life has a way of beating you up to the point. I don't know whose voice to trust. That's not a shame. That's not an indictment. It's simply saying, Lord, I need you. There was a father who brought his demon-possessed son to Jesus and said, Lord, if you can heal my child, heal him. And the Lord says, if you got to believe I can. 
And the father made a statement that Jesus did not correct him for. He said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I believe. Help my unbelief. I can believe for this. I don't know that I can believe for that. But he was willing to say, help me get there. That may be somebody here today. Lord, I do love you. But sometimes I have a hard time following you. Or would I even know in the middle of a storm, in the middle of the darkness, in the middle of heartache, would I be able to pinpoint your voice from everything else? Listen, God knows what he's doing. He doesn't need you to move mountains. He just needs you to follow him. That's it. So I want you to bow your heads with me right now. And Lord Jesus, we come to you today with an acknowledgement that first of all, we do love you. But Lord, we want to love you more. And Lord, we come with the acknowledgement of we want your will. But Lord, we want your will more. Sometimes the will of God is contrary to the will of our plans, the will of our calendars, the will of our schedules, the will of our time. Father, I pray right now that you search this crowd, Holy Spirit, and begin pricking the heart of those that need help identifying you and following you. That, Father, you're not here to cast blame. You're not here to, to make fun of. You're not here to scorn somebody. Instead, tonight is a divine appointment for somebody to just get to know you more, more intimately more trusting. So Father, I pray right now, if there's a heart that's pricked, that Father, I pray, show yourself to them in a measure they've never experienced before. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak to their spirit, that they can hear you like they've never heard you before. If there's ever been a day and an age where the people of God needed to know how to hear the voice of God, it's today. That, Lord God, you lead us in our families. You lead us in our jobs. You direct our finances. You guide us, Lord God, in everything we do. We want you to. So, Father, I pray right now, help us to hear you. Because sometimes, Lord, sometimes that leading... Mm, come on, I feel the Holy Spirit moving right here. Sometimes it calls for a drastic life change. Sometimes it means picking up and doing something else, going somewhere else, making a change in our life. And Father, I pray right now for wisdom and strength. Wisdom to know your voice and the strength to let it happen. I feel like right now, if you'll indulge me just a second, I feel like the Holy Spirit's dealing with somebody about a career change. I don't know who that is, but I'm, you weigh that out. That's between you and the Lord, but I feel like God's directing somebody in that path. There's somebody here right now, you're worried about your family and worried about how on earth do I reach my family and the Lord's saying, let me reach them. You just bring them to me and I'll make sure they get reached. Father, there's a good thing happening here. And I pray that you would attune our ears to hear, our eyes to see. You created us with senses, not just to experience food or weather or, or things like that, but God, you gave us the senses to be engaged with you. We are to, to experience you in every way. And Father, I pray that right now you would help us to experience you that way. And Father, I'm believing for a testimony to come out of this very night, Lord God, and next week when we again talk about the leading of the Holy Spirit. I believe that, Lord God, you're challenging us to be more than we've ever been, to see you greater than we've ever seen. That, Father, I apologize for any time we have ever put you in a, in a small box and tried to make you seem small. You are great. 
and you are mighty, and you 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 blow all of our thoughts to the wind. The Lord's putting something heavy on my heart. Can we just be the church tonight? Is that all right? There's some people need they need prayer. And again, this is a church. This isn't indicative of sin or anything, but there's there's some people here that you're going through it. You're going through a hard time. You're dealing with some stuff. And I will tell you, the best place you can be is right now because the Bible says that the body is to minister to the body. And this is not a moment of, of embarrassment, but what it is, it's a moment of emboldening. I want you to know you're not alone. I want you to know you're not alone. And if you're here tonight, I want us to be able to come around you and pray for you. If you're here today and you'd say, Pastor, I, man, I'm really needing a touch from God today. Maybe hurting maybe suffering in your mind, whatever it is. You may be here saying, I don't know what to do. Guess what? We want to pray for you. And if you're here today, I'm going to ask you if you would, just raise your hand. You say, I need prayer right now. I need prayer. Lift those hands and hold them up. All right, lift, keep them up. Please don't put them down. Keep the hands up. All right, church, I want you to look. I want you to look and I want you to find these with their hands raised and I want you to get up and go to them. If you raise your hand, keep it up and to remain seated. But I want you, if you see somebody right around you with their hand raised, would you please go to them right now? You don't need to know what the need is. It's not your business. But what, what's needed is we've got loved ones that need to be prayed for. We've got loved ones that are going through something and we want to gather around and we want to show our love for each other and for the Lord we serve by lifting these needs up. Father God, right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, as we gather around these that are going through something, Father, we're just going to pray, let your peace surpass all understanding. We're going to declare right now your peace, Lord God, to be with them, comforting the mind, comforting the heart, comforting the spirit. Lord God, we declare that, that whatever that need is, we're going to declare for that need to be met right now in Jesus' name. That, Father, if it's a healing, if it's a direction, if it's wisdom, if it's a provision, whatever that need is, God, we're going to pray right now, meet that need. And, Father, I pray that those that are being prayed for can feel the love of God and the love of their church family gathering around them. Lord God, to know we are not alone. We are not alone. But you have us and you hold us and you keep us. And, Father just as they're surrounded with people lifting them up right now. I believe that when they go home and they get in bed tonight, they're still going to feel the presence of somebody with them. And that's going to be the Holy Spirit that makes sure they know they are not alone. They are not alone. And God, we just say thank you. Thank you for how you move. And Lord, we're going to declare right now these, these needs are going to be met. We declare that they are being met right now, Lord God, that you are having your way. And Father, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for, for the testimony that's going to come out of this. And God, we give you the glory. We give you the honor and the praise right now. In Jesus' name. Somebody said a good amen. Hallelujah. You feel like you got something from God tonight? Amen. Well, I hope you did. Hope you did. Stand with me if you would. Don't forget all the good things we got going on to the to the board and the elders. Don't forget we have a meeting right after this. And uh, I had a tacky comment mentioned earlier saying, did your wife dress you because y'all look the same? <laughs> and I want you to hear this with all the love in my heart. Mind your business. <laughs> if my wife wants to dress me, that's right, right with me. Happy wife, happy life. Yes, sir. God bless you. Thank you for coming to church tonight.